I invite you to turn with me to the book of 1 John in chapter 5. We're starting up at verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is... Uh, because the Spirit is the truth. And there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And the three are in agreement. We accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God, which he has given about his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because they have not believed the testimony that God has given about his Son. And this is the testimony God has given us, eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. You'll notice in the scripture here, this is how we know that we are children of God, that we love God and obey his commands. This is how we know because of the testimony of God. We're coming to the conclusion of our study in 1 John, and today is the second to the last next week will be the last and in this we have been studying and learning how do we know that we're christians how can we be sure how can we have assurance that we're christians and we've given plenty of biblical definition the relationship you have with god the eternal life the salvation it's all about jesus now it's about Jesus the person. It's not about Jesus the philosophical concept. It's not about Jesus in some other way. It's about the person of Jesus. We have said in different occasions, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. Um, that had meaning at first until people that have no relationship with Jesus said that it's not about religion, it's about a relationship and then use the fact that it's about a relationship as a covering for the fact that they had no relationship with Jesus and just as a way to wiggle out from underneath of what they felt like were the rules and the regulations of religion. I'm kind of careful anymore to say things like that because I don't want to miscommunicate. And people have created miscommunication because they have redefined things and they're constantly redefining Every definitive thing that we have to say, they want to redefine it about something else. But they can't redefine Jesus. Jesus is a person. He is exactly who he is. I am a person. I am exactly who I am. You may have a theory about Pastor Scott, and you may have an idea about Pastor Scott, but the people that know me know me. Okay, and they may know me uh, on one level or know me on another level, but they still know me, and I'm a person. 
And if they wanted to know more about me, they could ask. And I would freely give to them more information. It's the same thing with Jesus. We all know Jesus, all of us that are Christians, we all know Jesus. We know him to at least some extent. We know him to, from whatever vantage point we have gotten to know him together as a church discussing our experiences with Jesus, we could actually help each other get to know Jesus better. But when it comes down to it, if we wanted to know more about Jesus, we could ask him. And James says he will tell us freely, but we can't doubt and we can't call him a liar. Jesus isn't interested in having a conversation with you about himself if you're just going to blow it back in his face and say, Pfft. he doesn't have time for that. Jesus is king of kings and lord of lords. Do you think he has time to be bum of bums? And to be so far below you that you have the right to disagree with him and call him a liar? He's not the bum of bums. He's not the hobo of hobos. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. He's not below you. You're below him. And oft times we go to the Lord with all kinds of doubts in our minds as if somehow he's going to shoulder them. Yes, he's big enough to handle them, but this is how he handles them. He's not going to listen to you. He's not going to deal with you. What does it say? Without faith, it's impossible to please God, for he who comes to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. You come to God and you say, mm, I don't really believe that you exist. So whatever, you know, people make you up, whatever. If you don't believe that there is reward in seeking him out, you're never going to seek him. You're just playing games. Don't play games with God, okay? For one thing, he's a Monopoly champion. He will beat you every time. God knows the score. You probably don't. And the score is Jesus. Ultimately, that is everything. All love and salvation is in Jesus. This means if you do not have Jesus, you do not have love as God <clears throat> excuse me, as God defines love. My voice is still a little harmed from my recent bout with a cold, so I'm squeaking a lot today like a uh, adolescent child. But uh, nevertheless, <laughs> I will press on. Um, but uh, God defines love differently than you and I define it. We define love based upon how people affect us. God defines love based on how he affects people. And it's, it's different. Believe me, God does not get love the way he deserves love from his creation. He doesn't. He does not get love the way he deserves love from you. Every one of us here could say, I love God, I love God, I love God. But when it comes down to it, there's a limit. Do you love God in the storm? Do you love God in poverty? Do you love God even though you don't have money to put food on the table? Do you love God even though your children are weeping? We have our limits. We say, well, God loves me, so things should be going very well for me. But then I think about the testimony in Hebrews 11 about all of the different people that served God and how they were destitute. How many of them were chased from town to town. How many of them were killed for their faith. How many of them lived in caves and in holes in the ground and had to wear had to wear the skins of animals because they had no money for clothing otherwise. I don't read 
in the scripture about how God prospers people every time simply because he loves them. I find that the closer you get to God, the more of a stranger you are to this world. And the more of a stranger you are to this world, the more likely this world is to hate you. Not love you, but hate you. So love as God, does, God describes it, as, as God sees love, it's not found in your ability or capability to love. It is found in his son, Jesus. If you have Jesus in your heart, then you will know what love really is. But you will never know it in a romance. You will never know it in a mother and, and child relationship or father and child. You will never know it on any level other than to have Jesus in your heart, the source of all true love. Jesus is also salvation. That means that everything in the scripture that talks about salvation is there for one reason. To get you to stop trying to save yourself and to receive Jesus Christ. As the scripture said earlier, in fact, this is love for God to keep his commands and his commands are not burdensome for everyone born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus Christ is the son of God. So we see that overcoming faith doesn't matter unless it's faith in the overcomer. The overcomer is Jesus. Each one of us, when we were growing up in, in school, were given an English textbook, a math textbook, and other textbooks. And we had to receive by faith what those teachers taught us in those books. We had to receive by faith that this is the proper way to speak English. This is the proper way to structure a sentence. That one plus one really does equal two. And you say, well, I have evidence for that. Yes, but at first you had to receive it by faith. What about your social studies and history? What about philosophy and other things? All of these things are received by faith. And many times you are not taught the correct things in those subjects. And yet we receive them by faith. Yet we will receive by faith from a human teacher blindly anything they teach us. But when the Bible tells us something, we refuse to accept it by faith. And we say to God, prove it. Prove it. Show me. Demonstrate. The teacher can tell you all they want about their ideas about history, their ideas about philosophy their ideas about politics, and we just receive it. We nod our heads. Well, you're the teacher, okay, I guess, that we just, we're, okay. Jesus tells us his viewpoint, and we say, pff, pff. Salvation is in Jesus. Without Jesus, there is no salvation. If you believe that he is the Son of God, you already have overcome because you have put faith in the one who overcame. You yourself will never overcome. On your own, you will never overcome this world. Jesus is the victory. Not the teachings, not the healings, and not the religion alone. Many of us have struggled all of our Christian lives trying to follow the teachings of God only to find that there is a strange dissatisfaction. Many of us have spent our lives seeking out the miraculous healings and miraculous deeds of God only to find that they're so few and far between that we wonder whether or not nature would have gone ahead 
and wrought these miracles without our prayers or our intervention or our seeking out of God. Many of us have found peace and have found rest in the religion of church. We found fellowship, we have found uh, harmony, we have found uh, the kind of belonging that we're looking for, and plus we get a rousing positive message every Sunday to pep us up so that we can make it through another week. But none of these things will save you. If you were to take the teachings of Jesus, let, let's just set aside the Old Testament for now. We should never do that in practice as real Christians, no. But for now, mentally, let's just set it aside. If you could follow just the teachings of Jesus 100%, and you can't, but if you could, you would still not be saved. No. No. If you were to experience healings and miracles every day, if you were to see people raised from the dead and demons driven out of people, if you were to see the lame walking and the blind getting their sight back and the deaf receiving their hearing, if you were to have a constant regular diet of all of that, in the end you would still not be saved. And you say, well, how could one see that without it? Well, the scripture says this, and this is Jesus' testimony. He says, many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord. Did not we drive out demons in your name? Did we not profess your name? Did we not teach others to serve you? Did we not? And Jesus says, I will say to them, get away from me. I never knew you. It is possible that a person could be in the company of all of the great things of God, but never having received Christ as their savior, I'm not saying received his teachings, received his healings, received the story of Christ. I'm saying if you've never received the person of Christ, and this is verified as we have read in the scripture, it is verified by the Holy Spirit coming into you, changing you, an encounter with God to where the sin you used to love, now you hate to where the direction you used to travel, you now travel in the opposite direction. Have you received the person of Jesus Christ because it is him that is the salvation of men? It is him that is the victory because he has overcome. If you put your faith in him, you overcome by virtue of Jesus Christ, not by virtue of his teachings, by virtue of his healings, or by virtue of his religion. You overcome by virtue of the person of Jesus because he was the only one that could love God the way he deserved to be loved, that could overcome sin. He is the only one. If you are found in him in the day of reckoning, you will be saved. But if you are found still on the outside trying to substitute with his teachings or with miracles or with some other thing to satisfy your flesh, you're going to find that you will not be on the right side of the Savior, but he will usher you off to the left. And to those on the right, he will say, well done. Enter into the joy of the Lord. And to those on the left, he will say, depart into everlasting fire prepared for the demons and, and the uh, angels, the devil and his angels. Last of all, all things testify to Jesus. If you read the Old Testament, the Old Testament is designed to do one thing, 
make you aware that you're a sinner so that you will call out for a savior. If you read the New Testament, the New Testament is designed to do one thing, make you aware that even after you have the savior, you still must daily overcome the flesh. There is no perfection for the individual. God has no perfection in store for you, none. I long to be perfect, I do. I long to be like Jesus Christ, I can't. But I can belong to him. I can be found in him. I can be made one flesh with him through my relationship. The law testifies to Jesus. The Spirit of God testifies to Jesus. For the Spirit who hovered over the waters of the deep moved God to speak. And when he said, let there be light, that was Jesus. For Jesus is any manifestation of God. If I were to ask you, show me your mind, you might be able to show me where it is contained, but you could not open up your brain and show me your mind. If I was to say, show me your soul, you could dig around somewhere in your body and still not find your soul. For both are spiritual in nature. The only manifestation your mind or soul has is your body. It is like that with God. The only manifestation of his mind, the Father, or his soul, the Spirit, is the body, Christ. And so when Jesus speaks things into existence, John joins with him in testimony and he says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. Through him were all things made, and without him was not anything made that has been made. And he is righteous in saying so. The water, baptism, testifies of Jesus. We have the water at the time of the flood of Noah. And that, my friends, was Jesus finding grace with no, finding that Noah found grace with God. That was Jesus that gave him that grace. When they passed through the Red Sea, that was Jesus that parted the Red Sea. It was a physical manifestation of God's power. When they passed through the Jordan, that was Jesus that held back the waters. The scripture has always pointed to Jesus. The Psalms point to him. The prophets point to him. Everything points to him. And the water that we are baptized with, when we are baptized into Christ, we go into the water as part of the world come out of the water, having been washed symbolically. But Jesus tells us that that washing, that daily washing you and I must have comes by the word. And then last of all, the blood. The Bible says repeatedly in the law, in the blood is the life. And the life of Jesus testifies to you and I. And so we have testimony overwhelming throughout the scripture. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is King. Jesus is all. He is salvation. He is love. He is life. He is hope. He is baptism. He is everything. To have the things of Jesus, but to not have Jesus is to fall short of the glory of God. And we have all fallen short of the glory of God, but he has given us Jesus Christ so that 
the distance between us and perfection could be made up in him. Jesus is your righteousness. Jesus is your holiness. Jesus is your all in all. And for us to struggle and to strive to do anything less than to simply remain in him, to simply abide in him, it is a pointless and aimless struggle. Go to your prayer closet. Go to your scriptures. Get to know this Jesus Don't just expect him to hang out with you. You hang out with him. Don't expect him just to show up. You show up. If you love him, if he is your king, if he is your Lord, bow before him in the morning and ask him, what would you have me to do? Close the day by asking him, how did I do? Ask him every day. Seek him out every day. Every day that you can bless someone, bless them. You're a child of God. You come from heaven. You've got all the blessings of heaven at, at your fingertips. Use them. Reach out. We can do so much because we have already overcome we're not struggling to overcome. We have received him who overcame. So rest in your assurance. Do not call him a liar, but believe in his son, Jesus. And if today he commands you, obey his command. If today he urges you to Pray with someone, pray with them. If today he urges you to spend more time in prayer, spend more time in prayer. If today he gives you no urgencies at all, live as you know you ought to live. 